We've all but forgotten about the idea of a 3090 Ti. And then this arrived. And it's heavy. <laughs> The K70 RGB Pro retains the iconic elements of the award-winning K70 RGB keyboard with a durable aluminum frame, genuine Cherry MX mechanical key switches, and per-key RGB backlighting while setting a new bar for performance with Corsair's Axon technology. Powered by Corsair Axon hyper-processing technology, the K70 RGB Pro processes and transmits your inputs up to eight times faster than conventional gaming keyboards with 8,000 Hz hyper-polling and 4,000 Hz key scanning and up to 20 layers of hardware RGB lighting. To see the complete list of features and updates found in the Corsair K70 RGB Pro keyboard, head to the sponsored link in the description below. All right, 3090 Ti time is here. Um, this was actually delayed like three months. It was supposed to come out in December or something like that. Um, this is the EVGA version. I can't remember exactly which one it is. EVGA actually has three SKUs at launch. There's a bit of changes. This is not just like a, here's a few extra CUDA cores, and here's some more clock speed version of a 3090, apparently. This is what NVIDIA is dubbing, jeez. This is what NVIDIA is dubbing the uh, Titan level graphics, which is funny, because that's kind of what they dubbed the 3090 as. Okay, this is the EVGA for the Win 3 Ultra, EVGA variant. Um, let's just get it out of the box. Guys, this is nearly a four slot card. I only know that because EVGA told me that, but I saved the unboxing for you guys <laughs> so that we can get a realistic like response without me having seen it first. It's so big and so heavy, it even comes with what's called a leash that's designed to hook onto the graphics card and hang from the case because they knew that putting standard supports underneath would just crumble and buckle under the weight of this card. So now they're hanging it. <laughs> just like you might want to do after you see the MSRP. We'll start with the accessories before we get to the good stuff. Jesus Christ, this cable. So it is a minimum of 850 watts required. This is the, the same plug like you would find in a Founders Edition card. Uh, the 12 pin, I think there's a 16 pin version of this card coming out now. This is what you're gonna see on all future gen graphics cards is this small plug, um, which admittedly is a, would be a lot neater, nicer to look at, than these, but you still have these. So these are three eight pins going to the new, like I don't remember if it was actually Intel that designed this, whatever, the 12 pin standard. 850 watt minimum on this card. If you're using the cable that EVGA makes that goes direct from the 12 pin into the power supply, which has um, the, like the modular plugs on the other end, so you don't have to deal with these adapters, a 1000 watt power supply is recommended. I have not seen a 1000 watt recommendation on anything short of SLI ever. And that includes the Fermi days. So this is the E-leash, <laughs> it's what they call this. So it's a hook, right? It's literally a hook and pulley. <laughs> if you ever needed a crane to hold your power supply or your graphics card, well now you can. So you literally loosen this guy right here, right? and then you can lengthen it. This is just absolutely nutso. This is bonkers, man, that this would even be necessary. <laughs> it literally is a metal cable. I think it's metal. I think it's metal inside there. That hooks onto your graphics card and it hangs on the top of your case. The only problem is you might start buckling in the top of your case when you see this thing. Okay, that's interesting. We'll, we'll try like sticking it in a case or something back here just to see how well this works because I'm curious as what the sag looks like. There's also something I'm very proud of. And I don't know if I was allowed to say this, but I'm going to anyway. They said this change came directly from my videos. I single-handedly, apparently, enacted this change. Phil, they reinforced the IO bracket so it doesn't flex. <laughs> oh my lord. Hold that hand back out. Oh jeez. Get ready to catch it. Okay. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's at least, it's more than five. <laughs> I wish we had a scale. Look at this, this thing. Look at, hey, the backplate looks cool. Look at all the hexagon stuff. Apparently all the RAM has been moved to the front side of this uh, board, but holy crap. So look where they moved the power plug to. So instead of being on the top right here, it's back here. 
Now this is a this is not as long as you might expect. EVGA doesn't go for like super long cards. They definitely go tall and thick, but heh, this plugs in here. Which means you're gonna have to account for that extra length in your case, because if the plugs aren't here, this is what you have to account for, right? And you don't wanna put a ton of pressure on that plug. You don't wanna break it. So keep that in mind. So they've made some, a few minor aesthetic changes. Like this is kind of like a dim, like a rubberized almost, no, it's plastic, but dimpled surface here. Very similar RGB right here. Um, it's a 3.75 slot card. So that means we're talking four slots because you can't have a partial of a something in a slot and not take up the slot. So it's a four slot card. And on the back, you get the typical RGB connector as well as a fan header so that you can control fans or fan signal. Uh, you could send this out to like a controller to have fans in your system ramp up with GPU usage. That way you can up the cooling in your case by having the graphics card trigger it. You can, you can see where they tied in the bracket. That bracket is connected. So it's no longer extra flex, flexy and flimsy. If they did this right, and he said there was other reinforcement things in there, they had to. I guarantee this would just, you put it in your case and it'd be like, Bruh. it is so heavy. Let's throw it in a case real quick. Um, actually, before I do that, let me see where this goes because, oh yeah, so check this out. You've got this little tab right here, which goes over this way. So it goes boop, boop. <laughs> Incoming. It does look like a crane. Like, <laughs> yes, it does. That is ridiculous. You know what? Before we put it in the case real quick, let me get a regular 3090 just so you can see. Like, I say regular. <laughs> let me get the 3090 for the win so you can compare the size. So this is the standard 3090 for the win 3. This is the 3090 Ti for the win 3 Ultra. Dude, it's like the same length pretty much, but let's look at this thickness change here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is what we complained about on the old card. There's literally no tie-in. So if you look at the new one, that's not possible because it's tied in. Compare the back plates. That's the part you more often see if it's installed standard. Tell me the new one doesn't just look a million times better than the old one. <laughs> First of all, there's no stupid red line in it. They got rid of the clown lips a long time ago. So I never even realized it was red down here too. I just realized that for the first time. Yeah, because look, the GeForce RTX there is silver. Yeah, it just looks good. All right, let's see how this cable system works. This is this is awesome looking though, it really is. Oh, um, forgot to mention, it's a three BIOS card versus this one's two BIOS. The only difference there, honestly, is gonna be the fan behavior. So standard, you've got a zero dB fan mode, which means when the, the card is under load, the fans turn off for zero noise and no dust adding up in the card or building up unnecessarily. You got a performance mode, which uh, changes the fan behavior to a non-zero dB and it changes the fan curve. And then you've got uh, the, the OC, which is like the maximum fan curve available, noise, screw noise, we want cooling. Um, I don't believe that changes anything on either of those BIOS in terms of power limits. But I'm curious to see as to what kind of power limits are available to us on this card. First, let's see whether or not we need to reinvest in steel to support it. So. By them tying it in, like we suggested, it doesn't even look like it needs it. It's so solid in there because it's tied in, like we showed in that video that, that all graphics cards should be doing that. However, I'm curious now. I want to see if this just looks dumb in there. Oh, okay. Let's look at my radiator. Oh no, there's a thing right there I can hack it to. I need more length. If someone had told me years ago Jay, you will be using cables to support the graphics cards in the future because they will be so big. I'd be like, what? There. Okay, I mean, it's not pretty. <laughs> it ain't the prettiest thing. But you know what? If it asks you to the prom, you're gonna go. I'll be honest, it's ugly. Like, not the card, the, the, the leash thing. It's free. But with a proper case that's not as, as super flimsy, um, the card didn't really seem to need it. Honestly, I would, I would, I would not be concerned at all about, okay, it just fell off. I wouldn't be concerned at all about this. This is solid. It really is. But you know, we need to see if the performance is solid and whether or not it's worth the MSRP 2,200 US dollars.
3090 Ti. Um, okay. It's understandable that a company like Nvidia would want to kind of keep evolving slash pushing the boundaries of what is the flagship model. The performance on this proved it is time for us to update our bench suite, like the, the suite of software that we use. My methodology for years has always been, I use a mix of synthetics, I use a mix of CPU bound titles, and I use a mix of very GPU bound titles. The problem is those titles over the years now seem to become more of a, the title is an issue with getting fluctuation in performance than say the graphics card itself. The reason why I'm mentioning that is you might notice a few titles, some weird anomalies where the 3090 Ti was actually scoring below a 3080 Ti. But when we go back and look at the, the chart, when we're actually investigating, okay, what's happening with this title, we found that at 1440p, we are still bottlenecking with this card in quite a few of the older titles. And that's just because of how fast the FPS is able to get, even in 1440p, that we really start to see the CPU, which is an overclocked 10900K, be the issue with the graphics card. And what we found with the 3090 Ti is that it was bottlenecking so hard that when it was actually pulling back the GPU utilization, that it was pulling back performance below a card that was even a tier or two below it. So it's like the performance rebound was so all over the place that the average FPS is lower. Max FPS in even the bottleneck titles is higher than those cards. But the 0.1 and 0.1 lows at that point are much lower than those cards that are lower tier, giving us that huge fluctuation, which is why the average comes down. So there's a lot of testing we're gonna be updating here in the future. Um, it's no surprise and it's no news to anybody around here that we are more the average layman's type of review. I highly recommend that you go and check out all of the super detailed reviews that you'll find from like Ian Cutris, excuse me, Dr. Ian Cutris. He's earned that title, he, he deserves it. Uh, obviously, um, Gamers Nexus, and there's gonna be, uh, I'm, I'm sure that Bill Zoy is gonna talk about this. And there's a lot of people out there that go deep dive, and if you're into that, I highly recommend those channels. But what this showed is that even with a 10900K overclocked, which I'm personally running at home because my build is still over there, not done yet, would be bottlenecking this CPU in certain titles. Now, not necessarily with my resolution because what we found at 4K, it was always full utilized, you know, 100%, well, 99%, 98%. A CPU load really comes down and FPS was above those other cards pretty much across the board. Barring some, again, some weird outlier anomalies, which we've experienced every single time we've ever benchmarked a brand new graphics card in a new in an old game it takes time for drivers and update and, and profiles and whatnot with older titles to actually be somewhat optimized with newer hardware remember we do have more cuda cores and such in this graphics card we have a faster memory it's running effective 10,500 times two essentially so it's 500 megahertz overclocked on the base clock versus like a standard 3090 so that's how you get the extra memory bandwidth on this nvidia would tell you that this is a this is a um well they wouldn't call it poor man's but essentially be a poor man's production card with the 24 gigabytes of VRAM. Look, it's got a GeForce name on it. It's an RTX card, it's a 3090 Ti, which shares the same nomenclature with 3080s and all that, which they would say a 3080 and 3080 Ti is the ultimate gaming card. It's the same card with a little bit more. So it's still a gaming card, and that's how we tested it. I didn't do any of the production, like, workflows that we did with the 3090 when it came to like use, utilizing rendering and you, using the entire 24 gigabytes of frame buffer and seeing how it all performs. Um, it's obviously gonna be better than the 3090 in those applications. But is it worth the 2200? Price-wise, if we compare this to a 3090 for the Win 3, which is that first card we showed you at the beginning of this video where I compared it to, that card right now on EVGA's website, which is essentially them selling it direct for their own MSRP, is $1,919. This card is $2,199. That makes this card 15.5% more expensive for anywhere between seven to 10% more performance. So as you can see, the farther up the tier you go, the more exp like the, the diminished returns you get, price to value or FPS, dollar to FPS, so, or FPS per dollar. But there are people out there, like myself, who will say, I don't care, it's the best, it's the top of the line, and I'm gonna get it anyway. Well, if you can get it direct from EVGA, you'd actually pay less for this card than you would for say like a 3080 on eBay. So if you can get it, you know, that's obviously the cue. They've made changes physically that I'm happy with. I, I'm extremely happy that this is probably the, one of the most solid brackets I've seen on a graphics card yet. The, gra the back plate is the thickest I've seen on any graphics card ever, which is another reason why it is so 
perfectly level. I mean, you, the, the little cable system, that's cool. It's neat, it's, it's, a, it's an effort to solve a problem that they already solved right here. So if that existed for the old other card with the flimsy plate, then yeah, absolutely, please. Let's ship a, let's ship a crane with it like we got there. But they've done a, such, such a good job tying this in. And again, I'm extremely just satisfied with the fact that EVGA was listening when we were complaining about the way the bracket is, that um, it's not necessary. Aesthetically, it looks better on the back plate. The um, RGB light bar looks exactly the same as the 3090, which is one of the nicer ones on the market. Um, they blacked out all the ugly red on this. They finally listened, making this now, in my opinion, one of the nicer looking. Although some people really don't like the wave like this. The reason for this is it's just about airflow. Like if you were to have something in front of it that's kind of blocking it, you do have a path and channel for air to be sucked in through the sides rather than a smooth surface up against like, you know, a box. Why would you put it against a box? I don't know. Well, there's an SLI bridge on here and it's effective, effectively a four slot card. And if you used a four slot motherboard, you will have one quarter of a slot worth of gap between the cards. Think about that. Look, I'm the SLI snob. I always have been. And I'm saying if you're bottlenecking your CPU with one of these, if any title actually used SLI these days, with the exception of like 3D Mark and stuff, and that's I'm sure the only reason that's there, because I have no doubt a 3090 Ti Kingpin card has to be in the works. That's just for benchmarking and world records. That's all that's for. And you're gonna be taking the air cooler off anyway, and you're gonna be obviously um, either water blocking it or doing LN2 pot, then it won't matter anyway. I'm glad to see more improvement in the, in the family, but my fear about this is this is some way to extend the life of the family more, right? You come out with a card a year and a half into its family life cycle, does that mean that it's sticking around for a while with production the way it is and availability the way it is? It would be interesting if they tried to launch a 40 series card this year, but it wouldn't be the first time we've seen a new flagship and a new family in the same year. I obviously would have liked to have seen this silicon make its way to bolster the lower tiered SKUs that share the, the core architecture to get more cards out to market rather than launching a new flagship, more expensive card. I think a lot of people are gonna say that sounds very tone deaf. The reason for that, I have no doubt, is with the maturity of the 6900 XT process, how fast it's able to clock, and then titles that properly utilize that um, architecture, it was getting far too close and or passing the 3090 in too many results, which is why we now see a fully unlocked core architecture here with faster memory to get ourselves up into that um, you know, above the 6900 XT again. It's literally now, it's a drag race. You're, you're chasing tenths or you're chasing thousandths at this point to win. Temperature wise, the hottest temp we saw was 64C. More on average in the upper 50s to mid 50s and in some tests where it was bottlenecked down as low as 48 while the test was running. The cooler works. It should, the card, the card is able to pull something like 450 watts. Hence the 850 watt minimum. And if you pair that with how high Intel's, um, you know, cost and power is with 12th gen specifically, you can see why the 850 watts the minimum and more or less a recommended 1000 watt power supply for these graphics cards. Will I be putting this in my personal rig? Very unlikely. With my personal rig at home, I am running a 3860 by 1600 panel. So it's much closer to 4K, which means I wouldn't be bottlenecking it like a 1440p panel. It is ultra wide. Block compatibility, I don't know when that will be. I'm not postponing my build anymore simply because of the fact that I would wait for a block for this. I also feel like it's um, not worth the additional time to put off my build to simply have the highest tier card available in there. Would I want it in there? Of course, I would want the most powerful graphics card potentially on the planet in my system. But you, this does not just use old blocks that you would find in previous generation cards. Like you cannot take a 3090 for the Win3 block and put it on a 3090 Ti. It is a completely redesigned and Linus, are you okay? Okay, we're fine. Completely redesigned PCB. All the memories on the front, it is not compatible. You cannot take a 3090 block from the same, like for the Win3 and put it on 3090 Ti. So now you gotta wait for all that compatibility stuff. And uh, that's gonna be a while. So anyway. I would say sound off down below how you feel about the 3090 Ti based on today's video, but I have no doubt you've already formulated your own opinion. And you know what? I'm just gonna say three, two, one, fight.